Thanks for uh, tuning. And this is uh, my first contribution to this school, which is about general principles of networks and some application to brain connectivity. So let's get started. We can know even with great uh, precision all the components of a single system, but until we don't see all the things together, how it is connected, we won't fully understand this function. So the same applies to the brain and to several many other systems. Now, speaking of the brain, uh, the, the, the main questions that one may ask is which connections and which kind of connections exist in the brain? Uh, is it possible that regions that are not connected by neural fibers still communicate? It is possible to detect the flow of information in the brain. Let's leave this as a very general definition of flow of information. Which properties has this network communication? And then how this network change during task performing versus rest or disease versus health. So in the brain, we have uh, connectivity at different uh, scales and different types of connectivity, as we will see later. So we have uh, the anatomical or structural connectivity. Now we are talking about large scale brain connectivity. So not the individual connection between uh, uh, neurons, but anatomical connection between brain areas. So we have a non-invasive way of measuring it, which is diffusion tensor imaging. We'll see later how it works. And then we have invasive ways uh, which work, for example, with the uh, retrograde uh, uh, dye tracing. So injecting some products in some part of the brain, which is then uh, synaptically propagated to other parts of the brain. So the first uh, part, the non-invasive way of uh, recording anatomical connectivity at large scale, involves uh, estimation of the movement of water molecules in the brain. So for every voxel, so volumetric pixel, and uh, of the size of uh, roughly one cube millimeter, we measure the diffusion of water. And then in this way, we can determine the main directions along which the fiber is going, because water will uh, isotropically distribute in the gray matter, so where our neurons are. On the other hand, when it will encounter white matter fibers, will slide uh, alongside them. And so uh, with different uh, types of probabilistic algorithm, we can reconstruct the presence and the directions of these white matter fibers, more or less precisely. Then, <clears throat> after uh, this anatomical connectivity, we can define the so-called functional or dynamical connectivity, which is uh, nothing more, nothing less than statistical dependencies between uh, brain regions, even not neighboring one or not directly connected by uh, white matter fibers. And so we have different uh, ways of determining these uh, statistical dependencies. Here, uh, this is a scheme of the type of uh, networks, adjacency metrics, that we can extract uh, from an MRI scan of one person. So on the left, we have the anatomical connectivity, and on the right, we have the functional connectivity. So correlation between time series, um, thresholding uh, and metrics, which can be then uh, thresholded to give a binary addition symmetric or can stay a weighted one. And the same for the functional, uh, uh, the, uh, the anatomical connectivity. Each one of the entries of this matrix is a brain region. We will see later how we can define these individual brain regions, which is what is called the brain parcellation. And this is a old uh, picture uh, from the beginning of the uh, connectivity field is by the uh, Washington University group, which contrasts the structural connectivity on the right and the functional connectivity. So we can see the regions which are dynamically, uh, so statistically dependency, uh, so sorry, connected in the sense of statistical dependencies 
to this region indicated in blue on the left and on the right the same regions which are uh, connected by white matter fibers when it comes to uh, functional connectivity we can have directional versus uh, undirected links so the undirected links are given for example by synchronization uh, coherence correlation mutual information on the other hand the directed links are uh, Granger causality, transfer entropy, and uh, dynamic causal model. So now there is a huge surge of uh, journals, books on uh, brain connectome, and this is because seeing a complex system as a network, uh, as you can see, as you will have seen many examples, is a convenient way of uh, representing this information and of finding uh, interesting properties about the system and also because uh, many techniques have been uh, developed and applied specifically to the brain and in particular to large-scale brain architecture and you can see also in the number of papers we can see an increasing number of uh, fMRI and EEG papers, so an overall increase of papers, but on the other hand, the rates of uh, connectivity papers is even steeper. So this is a figure from uh, the a recent book of uh, Olaf Sporns, which is one of the key uh, actors in the fields of brain connectivity and a pioneer in the field, which describes the type of networks that we can encounter in uh, neuroscience and social sciences at different temporal and spatial scales. So uh, in spatial scales we go from the atom to the protein to the cell, tissue, organ and uh, system of organs. The time scales go from the molecular events to the human lifetime and uh, talking about uh, specific systems uh, we go from uh, molecules to synapses and neurons uh, networks of neurons etc etc until the whole uh, central nervous system and the type of networks that you observe are at the micro scale gene and protein networks or then when we go uh, a little bit uh, further network of neurons and synapses then at the mesoscale circuits and cell population and at the macro scale regions and pathways at the level of the whole brain and then if we go outside the individual brain we have uh, social networks which have been now started to be connected to neuroscience as well so let's look at networks starting with their key characteristics so the first the characteristic of a network is that we can see a network as um, an, an ensemble of pathways and this um, reminds of the very first application of network science or if you want the reason why network science uh, was born and uh, the semi anecdotal story is that in the city of Königsberg the uh, inhabitants knew that intuitively it was impossible to cross all the seven fields uh, without uh, crossing at least one twice and so uh, uh, Leonard Euler, a mathematician uh, familiar with the city started to develop a theory to demonstrate why, uh, why this would not have been the case so in this case the, these networks have some nodes which were the different parts of the city and the, the links between them were the bridges. By the way, nowadays there is an extra bridge having been built uh, on the river which makes the problem solved and trivial. The second characteristic of a network is an uh, expression of collective dynamics and that's why also we will uh, address uh, the brain 
in terms of networks. So for this, we start from the figure of Adolf Ketley. Uh, one of the reasons is because he is uh, born in Ghent, which is the city where I work now. And uh, Ketley was a kind of a big data scientist and literum because he was constantly in the um, investigating uh, behavior, a uh, collective behavior, but um, harvesting a lot of data. So he invented the the body mass index, and uh, one of these of his uh, main theories about free will was that um, when we consider a big number of individuals, the social dynamics are ruled by the collective stimulations in the network to which the individual belongs, rather the individual's will. So even crime, uh, he saw it as a statistical deviation uh, from an average behavior. And then um, we know that his theory were largely influential on um, the view and the theories of uh, James Clerk Maxwell in here in his uh, statistical uh, theory of gases, but also uh, influenced the figure of uh, Camilla Golgi, who was one of the early pioneers of uh, um, histology in neurons. So Camilla Golgi in his uh, novel lecture, um, these were the times in which uh, the technique known as staining, so basically uh, filling neurons with paint and then observing at the microscope was being developed. So on one hand, we could observe individual neurons. On the other hand, it was clear to some people that uh, those neurons, uh, the reasons why they were so interconnected was that they were acting as a whole, at least to a certain extent. So let's now address the basic definitions of networks. So a network is a set of nodes connected by links that we will call edges. Then the degree of a network is a number of edges connected to a node. And the degree distribution is a fraction of nodes with a certain degree. So this is an example of a very um, simple networks with uh, four nodes. Then the nodes can be linked directly by uh, single edges or indirectly by sequences of uh, intermediate nodes and edges. And these are the paths. So for example, a path from node one to node two, sorry, uh, a path from this node to this other. Node. So here again, uh, it's a this section of uh, a graph or network in nodes and edges and some examples uh, from a real world. So in the case of the train networks, the nodes are the station and the edges are rails. Uh, in the case of uh, internet as infrastructure, the nodes are server and the edges are cables. Social networks, we have persons and relations. In the brain, we have uh, brain regions or, and then uh, as edges, we have uh, white matter fibers in the case of large scale anatomical connectivity and the statistical dependencies across uh, time series recorded in different brain areas for the large scale functional connectivity. Now, a network can be uh, weighted or unweighted. In the first case, the um, edges have uh, a range of values. On the other hand, in the weighted graphs, they are either present or absent. And then a, net, a network or a graph can be directed or undirected. In the first case, we are able or we are willing to give a direction to the edges, so from A to B versus from B to A. On the other hand, uh, for undirected graph, we cannot or we don't want to establish this directionality. So one of the challenges of seeing the brain as a network is that we have 
an interplay of segregation and integration. What does it mean? It means that, for example, on one hand, we know that there are some regions of the brain which are specialized to see, uh, to hear, to remember things. But on the other hand, uh, brain function is a combination of all uh, of these actions. So it's not the same of uh, seeing a, a tiger in a zoo or a tiger in a bedroom, for example, when we wake up. So that's why uh, brain function and cognition arises from the interplay of this um, of the activity of these uh, specialized regions. And so when it comes to a measure to define this level segregation, the, the first one is clustering. Uh, clustering means the fraction of existing links between neighbors over all possible links. So high clustering uh, of a node means that this node connects other nodes which are well connected between them. We can define uh, a clustering index for each node of a network. So this is a local measure. And here we have several examples. In the first case, um, the central node I has a, a high clustering coefficient, and on the right, it has the lowest uh, clustering coefficient possible, T0, because the networks, sorry, the nodes which are um, connected to the node under examination are not interconnected between them. Then another measure of local segregation is modularity. So uh, modularity, the concept of modularity is that uh, a network is modular, so is comprised of subnetworks which are uh, more or less isolated between them. When we have many links within these modules and a few links between the modules, so this is an example of a modular networks. On the other hand. A network with roughly the same number of uh, edges, but low modularity would look like the network on the right, in which uh, the probability of having an edge within a module, so in this case within the green or the yellow, um, or the uh, red or the blue nodes, is not higher than uh, the probability of having an edge uh, between two nodes in different modules. There are several uh, measures to define modularity. Uh, I won't go through them now. Maybe you will see them uh, in other lectures in the school or uh, in general in the literature. In the brain, uh, how do we find or define modularity? So typically we look at which regions are more connected with each other. And uh, in the brain at rest, there is uh, a finite number of uh, main modules uh, that range from uh, a few, like uh, from five, six to uh, a dozen, depending on uh, how we uh, stop uh, defining uh, subnetworks. Uh, and typically, we see indeed uh, uh, a certain number of networks which correspond to important cognitive functions. We call them network, resting state, or intrinsic connectivity networks, but technically, they are uh, subnetworks of the general uh, brain network. So, this is an example of the main functional networks in the brain uh, default mode network, uh, visual network, sensory motor network, auditory network, dorsal tension network, and control network. Typically, the control network can be divided in uh, 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 lateralized subnetworks and also called the ceilings network. And these networks are uh, revealed by a special independent component analysis applied to the time series recorded at each voxel, so each volumetric pixel in the brain. So now, when it comes to divide the brain in regions, so to define the nodes of our network, we can use either an anatomical strategy, so we define uh, areas from an anatomical template, or uh, we can look 
at um, function template. So from the correlation between time series, we can uh, find modules. Within those, we can find submodules and obtain uh, a brain parcellation. So division of the of the whole brain, at least of the gray matter, that is where the neurons are, in different uh, regions, which will constitute the nodes of a brain network. Another uh, important characteristic of network and subnetworks uh, is network motives. Uh, network motives were defined in uh, genetics by the group of uh, Uri Allen in the, in the early 2000s as characteristic building blocks of a network, namely uh, small connected subgraphs that occur significantly more frequent than a randomized network. Uh, so in the brain, we observe a small set of structural motifs. On the other hand, a large number of uh, motifs in the functional connectivity network. So how do we identify network motifs? This is an example. For three nodes, all the possible ways in which they can be connected, apart from the case in which we have uh, disconnected nodes. So there are 13 possible subgraphs for three nodes. And so we find these graphs, and then we randomize several times the same graph, and then we uh, look at the relative distribution of each network module. So for each subgraph, we assign a z-score uh, comparing the real and the randomized networks. And then subgraphs with high z-score are called network motifs. And so, for example, uh, these are the structural motifs in the, in the cortex. In the human cortex, it's not uh, possible to exactly uh, define structural motifs because we don't have uh, access to uh, the full ground truth of the connectome, at least at the time uh, when this uh, paper was published, uh, which was uh, a few years ago. On the other hand, in the macaque cortex, we have uh, a certain uh, type of uh, motif. It is motif number nine, which is more uh, present than other one. And then in the warm uh, C elegance, we have other type of uh, motif, in particular uh, four and six. Uh, and here is um, the comparison of structural and functional motifs in the same brain networks as before. So as you can see, the functional motifs are much higher in number than the structural motifs. Now uh, we have seen measure of segregation. Let's go now to measures of integration. So how well uh, a network is connected, let's say. So given a set of nodes and edges, we remember that we have defined also the path. We can define the path length as a number of connection that needs to be crossed to go from one node to another. This measure is uh, intuitively very simple, but it varies a lot with sizes, density of graphs. And so another uh, measure was defined, it is efficiency, which is the average of the inverse of the path length. So in general, and then we'll see how this applies to the brain, segregation and integration uh, place opposite demands on networks. So optimal clustering and modularity are inconsistent with high integration. So there is little crosstalk among uh, highly segregated communities. On the other hand, optimal efficiency or integration is only achieved in a fully connected networks, which uh, lacks any differentiation in its local processing. So how we can reconcile these two uh, views? Uh, a convenient way by which uh, we can combine these two opposite demands is by considering heterogeneous contribution by individual nodes and edges. So how can we differentiate nodes in a network? 
for example, by looking at their influence and centrality, defining the hubs. Uh, hubs, we could define them in terms of number of links, but this is not enough to quantify the importance of a node because it depends on what the other nodes uh, are doing, how many connections overall we have, and so on. So the centrality is a fraction of uh, short path length passing from a given node. So a node is central if uh, is part of many short path length, many in the relative sense, of course, uh, compared to the total number of short path length in the network. So for example, this is a graph showing the most connected airports, so the airport with the greatest number of flights. On the other hand, when we go to the most central airports, we have some overlaps, but we have some other airports, in particular in um, more remote areas of the world, like uh, Alaska, Hawaii, and so on, which uh, are crucial for the global traffic, even though the number of uh, flights is uh, smaller than what we observe elsewhere. So in this cartoon, we can see on two dimensions uh, two key characteristics, the classical coefficient and the degree centrality. Uh, so in the top left cartoon, we have both low classical coefficient and low degree centrality. On the top right, the classical coefficient becomes high while the degree centrality stays low. On the other hand, on the bottom left, we have a network with high degree centrality but uh, low clustering coefficient. So this is not refers to a network as a whole, but to the node uh, depicted with the circle, because these are both local measures. And on the right, uh, on the bottom right, on the other hand, the circular node has high degree centrality and high clustering coefficient. If we go to the brain, um, this is a paper by uh, Hagman and Sports in 2008 uh, plus uh, biology. We have the nodes characterized uh, by a high degree and high strength of this connection. These were uh, five participants. Now it's possible to do the same exercise with many more subjects. And the size of the nodes is proportional to the consistency across subjects. So these are the networks which have the highest um, degree. On the other hand, when we consider a network with a higher centrality uh, and efficiency, we see some of the regions here in the posterior cortex, but also some of them in the frontal uh, cortex. When we consider the hubs in the brain, so the nodes which are most uh, central across the uh, rest, so in this case, fixation of a blank screen and a particular task, uh, we can see that there are some indeed frontal hubs and some uh, posterior uh, hubs as well as some parietal hubs. On the other hand, uh, if you go in the subcortical areas, in particular in the thalamus, the thalamus is an important relay center of the brain, and indeed it is a hub for a structural but also functional uh, connection towards all the rest of the brain. So it has been speculated that the, the thalamus, let's say, contains in itself uh, a mapping of the large scale organization of the whole brain network. Now, let's see how uh, the the hubs in the brain are related to energy consumption because uh, what we see we saw before is that uh, there are also uh, metabolic constraints to the formation of networks. 
So we can see that the most central hubs in the brain are also those with higher metabolic costs. And this, is, uh, this can be seen by looking at the, the glycolytic index. So how much uh, metabolite is consumed in each brain region. And this brings us to a new generation of network measures. So in this case, uh, the measure of uh, rich club coefficient. So once we have defined hubs, we have defined modules, also called communities. Uh, rich club R uh, is, let's say, the ensemble of hub nodes which are interconnected between each other. And uh, typically, they constitute the so-called core of the whole network. And this is uh, an example of how uh, the rich club is ubiquitous in the brain. So not all regions of the brain belong to the rich club, but we have members of the rich club basically everywhere in the, in the brain. And in particular, each one of the resting state network, so uh, the 6 to 12, here in this case, there are 11 of them, according to another definition uh, of this resting state network, contain one member of the rich club in the cortex. So uh, the architectural feature of a graph reflect the process by which the graph was constructed or developed. In particular, let's see what happens in the transition from regular to random. So this is uh, on the left, a regular graph, in which all nodes are connected to their neighbors. And then on the right, we have a random graph. So the same number of edges, but randomly distributed. If we try to go from the left to the right, taking one, then two, then three edges of the regular network and making them random, we can increase uh, gradually the randomness. What happens when we increase gradually the randomness? The path length immediately starts to drop. So it becomes immediately more easy to find, uh, to go from one part of the network to an arbitrary other node in the network. On the other hand, the clustering coefficient stays high, at least for a while, before dropping. And so we are left with the central region in which the path length is short and the clustering coefficient is high. So in which the two opposite demands, which are opposite indeed at the extremes, still coexist together. And this is the so-called small world regime, which is more or less ubiquitous in nature. Uh, indeed, the small world configuration optimizes both communication cost and efficiency. So the communication cost is high in random topology and low in uh, the regular topology. On the other hand, the efficiency is high Sorry, the opposite. The efficiency is higher in topology and low in uh, order topology, while the cost is low in order topology and the high in topology. So the small world effect was firstly observed uh, in the social sciences with the famous uh, Milgram experiment, which investigated whether uh, how many steps would have been necessary for a message to arrive from a random location in Nebraska to a clerk in uh, Chicago only through a hand-to-hand -hand passage. And they discovered that with a uh, limited, but still, uh, let's say, uh, representative sample, only a small number of steps was necessary in, on average to reach the target. A lot of networks are small world. But sometimes small wordness can arise even from non-profound mechanisms. So, for example, uh, if you have a random ensemble of time series, uh, we consider 
their uh, matrix of Pearson correlation, which by definition is a full matrix. And then we make it sparse by uh, applying a threshold. This network will have small world characteristics. So even if it's true that many real networks are in small world and probably this reflects an optimization of some important underlying principle, we have to uh, be careful because uh, the small world characteristic is not necessarily a reflection of something uh, profound happening. So, what makes this um, efficiency uh, possible? Also, in networks which are not random, so in which there are still uh, there is still some uh, uh, underlying organization. On one hand, we can have a weak or random ties. On the other hand, we can have hubs. So, think about. If you want to repeat the Milgram experiment, even at a large scale. So if I tell you, OK, go to uh, a remote village across uh, the other hemisphere only via personal connections, either you could go to your uh, local government representative and then to the representative of the remote government which can address you to uh, is uh, regional and then city government across the globe and this uh, in this case you're using the hubs so nodes in this case people which by definition and for their function they have to know a lot of people on the other hand there can be weak or random ties so uh, you can go to uh, a shop uh, near the corner and you can find someone who is originally from that part of the globe and with some luck they can also know some relative of your uh, randomly assigned target the signature of hubs in the grid distribution is a presence of a power law so these are the number of occurrences and the node degree so there are uh, many nodes with a very low degree zero or one and then only a few nodes with a very high degree and if we uh, represent this uh, cumulative probability and the node degree in a logarithmic scale we have a power law and this is a signature of the presence of hubs and then of the small world structure here we compare, uh, we have the Midwest of the United States, and we have the road networks. So the Midwest of the United States is very flat. There are no main obstacles. So it's quite easy to just build a road from one location to another. And this is then an homogeneous network. On the other hand, the air transportation network is a Characterized by the presence of hubs and also then of the scale free, uh, scale -free uh, property. In this case, we have a straight line in the graph of cumulative uh, probability versus no degree. Scale free networks are uh, self similar. And they are characterized by a given exponent, which is more or less always in the same uh, range for different types of uh, real world networks. Which is the mechanism which originates scale free network? Uh, the main uh, mechanism is the mechanism of preferential attachment developed by uh, Rick Albert and uh, Laszlo Barabasi uh, at the end of the last century which, uh, let's say, is also called the Matthew effect. Basically, rich gets richer. In the same way, the same mechanism which leads to uh, forming a network can be used to destroy a network. So, if we perform a random attack of a network, meaning uh, removing edge or nodes, at random, then uh, the 
the robustness of the communication of a network uh, goes down uh, linearly. On the other hand, if we target the attack of a network by removing the most influential nodes, then the communication breaks down much faster. So in the brain, where are the cortical maps? So here we have a graph in two dimension of clustering coefficient and path length. Uh, the small world region is here. Here we have random networks. And uh, for example, the structural connection of the macaque are positioned in the small world region. And this is um, a very beautiful figure from uh, a paper by Ricard Soleil and uh, Valverde in 2004, which adds a third dimension. So we have randomness, modularity, and heterogeneity. And so we have that cortical maps are characterized by a relatively high randomness, uh, high modularity, and uh, low heterogeneity. As opposed to other uh, biological networks, such as the proteome or the food webs or metabolic maps, which are characterized by, uh, in particular, a much lower um, randomness and higher heterogeneity. More topology uh, allows for lower resource consumption. So indeed, if we take a network of structural connection, in this case, uh, on the right hemisphere of the human cerebral cortex, and its randomized uh, counterpart, so we start randomizing more and more the network, we see that increasing the randomization, the small world index drops, and the wiring cost becomes higher. So we need more connection, uh, more uh, white matter fibers to connect parts of the brain. So this is a recap of the type of networks that we can have in the brain. Structural connectivity, so the edges can be physical limbs, links, uh, synapses, pathways at the micro scale. Uh, then empirical techniques to uh, find them is microscopy at the micro scale and the meso scale or a neuro neuroanatomy with tracing or neuroimaging at the large scale. And uh, these networks can be either weighted or unweighted. They, can, they are generally sparse and directed in the case of synapses. On the other hand, in the case of diffusion MRI, so large scale uh, connectivity in the human brain, are mainly sparse and undirected. On the other hand, the functional connectivity, which can be directed and, or undirected, is typically um, characterized uh, by uh, non-invasive techniques, uh, in part apart from uh, spike or local field potential recording, and involve uh, correlation, phase synchronization, uh, coherence, uh, and so on or uh, Grange causality or transfer entropy for directed connections. And so the networks are typically uh, weighted and directed in this case, in the case of uh, directed functional connectivity, or weighted and undirected in the case of functional connectivity. Then we can make them uh, unweighted by binarizing them, but this is uh, a choice which is debated and questioned. So how we go from data to network? We build our adhesion symmetrics. If we want, we can binarize it or symmetrize it. And so we can have different choices from going to uh, a certain number of brain regions and uh, the graphs which connect them. This is an example uh, in the primate brain, in this case, a monkey brain. We have the anatomical connectivity, in this case, a binary directed network, a functional connectivity, and effective connectivity. And both can be eventually threshold. Connectivity also changes in time. So we can change across milliseconds. So uh, we can have uh, fast functional changes at the synaptic level, but also they can change across years. So we can have a plasticity change due to 
genetics, environment, but also random changes. And so in this case, uh, there are several ways to characterize this connectivity in time. The easiest one is just to consider a sliding window and computing the statistical dependencies in each window overlapping. Or we can have uh, Markov models uh, which can characterize the switching across the states and so on. Now, when it comes to the clinical, the possible clinical application of mapping the connector, uh, we can see how a network or connectivity approach can be useful in some uh, clinical conditions. For example, in case of Alzheimer's disease, uh, the nodes which are mostly attacked by disease are the most expensive hubs metabolically. So, for example, this is the so-called default mode network, so the regions which are connected between them uh, when we are at rest. And this, uh, in red, in the center, we have the distribution of amyloid plaques, so uh, characterizing the progress and degradation of Alzheimer's disease, and the consequence, atrophy in the brain. Uh, a study which unveiled unbalanced small wordness in uh, schizophrenia uh, also yet, uh, showed that we have different characteristics between healthy controls and schizophrenics when it comes to uh, the balance between shortest path length and clustering coefficient. And then you can ask what happens in EG connectivity. So far we have seen fMRI, so functional magnetic resonance imaging. On the other hand, we can also have uh, connectivity, uh, so we can measure brain activity even in a cheaper way and with a much better uh, temporal resolution with electroencephalogram. On the other hand, the problem with electroencephalogram is that uh, the spatial resolution is uh, lower and in particular we have the so-called um, volume conduction uh, and forward and inverse problem that is activity is generated inside of the brain but we measure it on the scalp and so in this case the activity becomes mixed and entangled and somehow uh, hopelessly entangled so in this case we can build the frequency specific connectivity networks uh, because we have a much better uh, temporal resolution is of crucial importance intracranial recordings for clinical use in epilepsy and uh, cognitive use whenever we can record uh, inside of the brain. It's also used from scalp recordings. There's nothing wrong in looking at patterns of connectivity on the scalp and use them indicators, but on the other hand, in this case, we cannot say anything about interacting brain regions because uh, the activity is too mixed in moving from uh, electrically uh, conducting from the inside the brain to the skull. Uh, the topic of the next lecture will be about large-scale modeling, which is, uh, of course, uh, a very uh, consequent to connectivity. So once we have our structural connectivity, we can build a network, uh, a model of the brain, using this architectural network, then we can compare it with the empirical functional connectivity. We will see this in the next lecture. So this uh, a quote from uh, Steven Strogatz about the C-word curse. Uh, every decade or so, a grandiose theory comes along, bearing similar aspiration and often brandishing an ominous sounding C name. In the 60s, it was cybernetics. In the 70s, it was catastrophe theory. Then came case theory in the 80s and complexity theories in the 90s. So now we have gone through correlation, causality, and connectivity for a new C word. Thanks, until next time.